Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to our special Bookachino Live summer preview evening event. This is something that we started to do, I can't remember, maybe it was like last summer. And we said, why don't we do something about what's happening quarterly and invite people that may not be able to be there during the day to come on at night. So here you go. We are going to take it away. There we go. We're going to start with some fiction. And our first book is The rom Commerce by Catherine Center. It's on sale now. So let's see what this is about. Emma Wheeler desperately wants to be a screenwriter, but she's also been the sole caretaker for a dad who needs full-time care. So now she gets a chance to rewrite a script for a famous screenwriter, Charlie Yates, and it's too big a thing to pass up. Emma's younger sister steps in for caretaking duties. Emma moves to LA for the writing gig of a lifetime. But Charlie doesn't want to write with anyone, much less a failed nobody screenwriter. Worse, the romantic comedy he's writing is so terrible, it actually might bring on the apocalypse. Plus, he doesn't care about the script. It's just a means to get a different thing greenlit. And Emma's not going down without a fight. She's going to convince him that love stories matter, even if she has to kiss him senseless to do it. But what if that kiss is accidentally amazing? So there you go. Lots of fun. It's definitely a rom-com. Next, we've got Swan Song from Helen Hildebrand. It is out now. It actually just hit the New York Times list at number one. And this is her swan song of her final Nantucket novel. And I love the picture of this. I love the cover. I mean, the, the title and everything just makes perfect sense because she's decided not to write any more books that are set on Nantucket. She feels like she's mined that territory enough. And it was interesting. There was an article in the Times or the Journal a couple of weeks ago where she, they asked her how she writes. And she says, I put on my bikini, I go down to the beach and I start writing longhand. And then they said somewhere that she had 66 bikinis. So I thought that was just like a funny little tidbit. So what's this book about? Chief of Police Ed Kapanash is about to retire. Blonde Sharon's going through a divorce. But when a $22 million summer home is purchased by the mysterious Richardsons, how did they make their money exactly? Ed, Sharon, and everyone in the community are swept up in the high drama. The Richardsons throw lavish parties, flirt with multiple locals, flaunt their wealth with not one but two yachts, and raise impossible hopes of everyone they meet. When their house burns to the ground and their most essential employee goes missing, the entire island is up in arms. So there you go. Next, we got Tarantulas. Tarantulas. I think I did it right. Tarantulas by Porchiska Kakpur, which is out now. Iranian American multimillionaires Ali and Homa Milani have it all. A McMansion in the hills of Los Angeles, a micro microwavable snack empire, and four spirited daughters. There's Violet, the big hearted aspiring model, Roxana, the chaotic influencer, Mina, the chronically over online overachiever, and the impressionable health fanatic Haley. On the verge of landing their own reality TV show, the Milanis realize their deeper secrets are about to be dragged out into the open before the cameras even roll. Each of the Milanis, even their aloof Persian cat Parry, has something to hide, but the looming scrutiny of fame also threatens to bring their family closer than ever. Now, what you really need to know is that reality TV is not really reality. My husband was out one night when they were shooting a reality show and they did it so many times and there was so much practice. That I don't think the Milanis need to worry, but they're probably going to anyway. When you see something with book group speed dating down on the bottom, it means that this publisher included it in the speed dating program that we did a couple of weeks ago. We've got that um, in the recent newsletters and we'll be getting that to you um, a lot more so you can see what titles they talked about and their own verbiage on bringing the titles to life. Next, we've got Same As It Ever Was by Claire Lombardo, also out this week. Got a great review in the Times the other day. After a youth marked by upheaval and emotional turbulence, Julia Ames has found herself on the placid plateau of midlife. But Julia's never navigated the world with the uh, equanimity of her current privileged class. Having nearly derailed herself several times, making desperate bids for the kind of connection that always felt inaccessible to her, at age 57, she finally feels she has a firm handle on things. Julia's unprepared, though, for what comes next. Surprise announcement from her straight arrow son, an impending separation from her spiky teenage daughter, and a seductive resurgence of the past, all of which threatened to draw her back into the patterns that she previously had kept on razor's edge. They have kept her on razor's edge, rather. So there you go. Same as it ever was. Next, we've got Sandwich. 
And this is the June top library reads pick. Library fans across the country um, vote on the books that they feel that are um, they want people to go out and read. And this is the top pick. It's by Catherine Newman. For the past two decades, Rocky has looked forward to our family's yearly escape to Cape Cod. Their humble beach town rental has been the site of sweet memories, sunny days, great meals, and messes of all kinds. This year vacation with Rocky Sandwich between her half-grown kids and fully aging parents promises to be just as delightful as summer's past, except perhaps for Rocky's hormonal bouts of rage and melancholy. Hello, menopause. Body's changing, her life too, and then a chain of events sends her into the past, reliving both the tenderness and sorrow of a handful of long ago summers. And when Rocky comes face to face with her family's history and future, she's forced to accept that she no longer can hide her secrets from the people she loves. Next from Christy Woodson Harvey, we've got A Happier Life coming on June 25th, which is Tuesday. The present day, Keaton Smith is desperate for a fresh start. So when her mother needs someone to put her child at home in Beaufort, North Carolina on the market, she jumps at the chance to head south. But the moment she steps foot inside the abandoned home, she's confronted with secrets about her grandparents who died in a car accident before she was born. Now let's flip to 1976. After meeting her husband Townsend, Rebecca Beck St. James abandoned the life she knew and never looked back. But she's struggling behind the facade. Oops, no, I'm sorry. 40 years later, she's made a name for herself as the best hostess North Carolina has ever seen. But she's struggling behind the facade. As both Keaton and Bex face new challenges and chapters, they are connected through time by the house on Sunset Lane, which has protected the secrets, hopes, and dreams of the women in their family for generations. There, it's got another really summary cover. Next, we've got Honey from coming from Celadon Books next Tuesday. This is a summer reading selection. When you see that, that means that we're doing a contest about that book. Um, this one is coming up, uh, I think it's next week. So be on the lookout for that. But we always usually put con contests up on Tuesday, sometimes on Wednesday, if we have two in one week. So keep, uh, keep appeal for this. So it's 1997 and Amber Young has received a life-changing call. It's a chance thousands of girls would die for. The opportunity to join the girl group, Cloud Nine, in Los Angeles and escape her small town. She quickly finds herself in the orbits of fellow rising stars, Gwen Morris, a driven singer-dancer, and Wes Kingston, a member of the biggest boy band in the world, ETA. As Amber embarks on her solo career and her fame intensifies, her rich interior life is frequently reduced. Surrounded by people who claim to love her but only wish to exploit her, and driven by a desire for recognition and success, for love and sex, for agency and connection, Amber comes of age at a time when the kaleidoscope of public opinion can distort everything and one mistake can shatter a career. I think one of the times we're going to do like, you know, how you do a drinking game, <clears throat> we're going to do some kind of game and it's going to be the word life changing. How many times do I say that? And then at the end, you let me know. And I'll pick up like certain words that are in these um, descriptions because there's a lot of repeats of the words right now, folks. So here you go. This is copy from the publishers. Next, from William Morrow, we've got How the Light Gets In by Joyce Maynard. And I'm looking forward to this one. It's the eagerly anticipated follow-up to Count the Ways. And I really love Count the Ways. This is coming out on Tuesday. Following the death of her former husband, Cam, 54-year-old Eleanor has moved back to the New Hampshire farm where they raised three children to care for their brain-injured son, Toby, who's now an adult. Toby's elder brother, Al, is married and living in Seattle with his wife. Their sister, Ursula, lives in Vermont with her husband and two children. And although it all appears stable, old resentments, anger, and bitterness simmer just between the, beneath the surface. How the Light Gets In follows Eleanor and her family through 15 years, 2010 to 24, as their story plays out against a uniquely American backdrop and the events that transform their world, climate change, January 6th, school violence, and shape their lives, later love, parental alienation, and steadfast friendship. I really enjoyed Count the Ways, but I've been told that you could read this one on its own um, if you don't, if you haven't read Count the Ways. Next, we've got Boss Lady by Allie Frank and Asha Humans, who are two authors that I've been following, oh, I guess their last three books. I met them when they were debut authors, and I've always enjoyed their writing and the way they write together. Um, Asha is uh, black and she was the working in the school with Ali 
Um, Allie Franks is Jewish. And one day she was um, coming home from her parents' house in Idaho and said, Allie, um, Asha, let's talk about race. And from there, they've been writing books that have race as part of the story, but not as like, it's not just a, a topic that they're trying to push. Instead, it's integrated in real good storytelling. And I just love the way they've been written right from the beginning. Coming on July 2nd, We've got a promising inventor and budding entrepreneur, Antonia Tony Arroyo, fights to keep her passions alive as a financially strapped mother of twins with a job in airport transportation services that has her going in circles. One treasured fre frequent passenger is elderly traveler Sylvia Eisenberg, Tony's sage but unofficial advisor and cheerleader. When Tony meets Sylvia's grandson, Ash, a striking venture capitalist, luck just might bend her way. The game chaming new business entrepreneur endeavor in development, Tony hustles an opportunity to pitch her idea on TV's Innovation Nation. Tony's unexpected challenger, her very own recently resurfaced, not quite ex husband. As Tony's interrupted past collides with her tenuous future, she's more than determined than ever to follow through on her delayed dreams. When these two write, when they write about relationships or everything, it's just a lot of fun. I've got this um, on my uh, stack to read. Next, we've got from J. Courtney Sullivan, The Cliffs, coming on July 2nd. Another book that was discussed during speed, uh, speed, speed, speed dating. On a secluded bluff overlooking the ocean sits a Victorian house that contains a century's worth of secrets. By the time Jane Flanagan discovers the house as a teenager, it's long been abandoned. There are still clothes in the closets, marbles rolling on the floors, and dishes in the cupboards, even though no one has set foot there in decades. The house has become a hideaway for Jane, a place to escape her volatile mother. 20 years later, Jane returns home to Maine following a terrible mistake that threatens both her career as an archivist and her marriage. Jane is horrified to find the Victorian is now barely recognizable. The new owner, Genevieve, has gutted it and is convinced that it's haunted. She hires Jane to research the history of the place and the women who live there. And the story that Jane uncovers is even older than Maine itself. So Courtney Sullivan wrote Maine. She's the best-selling author of Maine. I can't wait to see what she does with this book. I always have enjoyed her writing. Next, we've got The Townsend Family Recipe for Disaster by Shauna Robinson, also coming on July 2nd. May Townsend has always dreamed of connecting with her estranged Black family in the South. She grew up picturing relatives who looked like her, crowded dinner tables and bustling kitchens. And of course, the Townsend family barbecue, the tradition that kept her late father flying to North Carolina year after year, despite the mysterious rift that has always required her to stay behind. But as May's wedding draws closer, promising a future of always standing out among her white in-laws, suddenly not knowing the Townsends hits her like a blow. So when news arrives that a paternal grandmother has passed, she decides it's time to head south. So here's their recipe for disaster coming July 2nd. Next, we've got Long Island Compromise by Taffy Brodesayer-Achner. Um, you might know her as the author of Fleischman in Trouble. She was at a luncheon that Random House threw a couple of months ago, and we just had so much fun talking to her. And you can see how her spirit is in all of her writing because she just basically sat down at her table and she says, I've been drinking a lot of wine. What do you want to talk about? And we were dishing on magazines today. We were dishing on Fleischman is in trouble. And yes, we were talking about the new book as well. So what have we got? In 1980, a wealthy businessman named Carl Fletcher is kidnapped from his driveway, brutalized and held for ransom. He returned to his wife and kids less than a week later and the family moves on in their lives. But now, nearly 40 years later, it's clear that perhaps nobody ever got over anything. Carl has spent the ensuing years secretly seeking closure to the matter of his kidnapping, while his wife, Ruth, has spent her potential protecting her husband's emotional health. The three grown children aren't doing much better. As they hover at the delicate precipice of a different kind of survival, they learn the family fortune has dwindled to just about nothing, and they must face desperate questions about how much their wealth has played a part in both their lives' successes and failures. And I know in Taffy's hands, this is just going to be a lot of fun. She has a real good way of just taking a sentence or a paragraph or a um, page and just turning it all around and making you laugh at the same time. Next, we've got the summer pack coming from Emily Giffen on July 9th also. 
Four freshmen arrive at college from completely different worlds. Lainey, a California party girl with flair for drama. Tyson, a brilliant scholar and aspiring lawyer from Washington, D.C. Summer, an ambitious recruited athlete from the Midwest. And Hannah, a mild-mannered Southerner. Soon after arriving on campus, they strike up a conversation in their shared dorm. College years fly by, the four become inseparable. With graduation years, their lives are forever changed after a desperate act leads to tragic consequences. They make a pact, promising to always be there for one another. Ten years later, Hannah is anticipating what should be one of the happiest moments of her life when everything is suddenly turned upside down. Calling on her closest friends, it soon becomes clear that they are all facing their own crossroads. So there we've got the summer pact. Next, we've got a book coming from Amy Neft. I absolutely love this book. Um, it's called The Days I Loved You Most. And what I really love about it is the way that Amy writes about a marriage and writes about a long time marriage. And what is really, really amazing about her ability to write about this is she is really young, yet she has this perspective on marriage that is so spot on of the ups and downs and the, the good days and the bad days and what's going on. So here's what we've got. Joseph's and Evelyn's New England beach homes have been side by side for decades. Summer of 1941, on the shores where they were raised, they fell in love. And now more than 60 years later, the lifetime between them, they gathered their grown children to share staggering news. Evelyn's received a tragic diagnosis and he can't live without her. So one year's time, they're planning to end their lives on their own terms. Now, that is a very, that is part of the book of where the book is going. But what we really want to do is what Amy does so beautifully here. As they come to grips with their fate, they retrace their past and what brought them to this moment. And they embark on a journey to create new memories to cherish, to live out their greatest dreams and to com comfort and connect with each of their children before they're gone. But as their final days grow closer, they have to co confront the stark reality of what they're about to do and makes peace with the legacy they will leave behind for their family. I will tell you, this is a beautifully, absolutely beautifully written uh, book. The fact that it's a debut is amazing. And it's, yes, they're thinking of ending their lives, but really what this is, is a celebration of their lives all, all along the way. And it's truly, truly wonderfully done. They're comparing it to the notebook, they're comparing it to other books, which are really about, you know, love there. And I absolutely adore the cover as well. It's one of our bets on selections. So you have a chance to win it in a couple of weeks too. Next, we've got Hum by Helen Phillips, which is coming on August 6th. And this too is a book group speed dating selection. In a city allowed by climate change and populated by intelligent robots called Hums, May loses her job to artificial intelligence. In a desperate bid to resolve her family's debt and secure their future for another few months, she becomes a guinea pig, an experiment that alters her face so it can, uh, cannot be recognized by surveillance. Seeking some reprieve from her recent hardships and from her family's addiction to their devices, she splurges on passes that allow them a three nights respite inside the botanical garden, a rare green refuge where forest streams and animals flourish. But when her children come under a threat, May is forced to put her trust in a hum of uncertain motives as she works to restore the life of her family. We've got hum from Helen Phillips. Next, we've got Creation Lake, which is coming from Rachel Kushner on September 3rd. Now, just so you know, for the uh, purposes of this um, uh, presentation, we are going to September 3rd, which is Labor Day. So we're starting on the first day of summer, and we really coordinated this, guys, so that we would do this on the first day of summer. But we're going to end on Labor Day, though Tom Donatio has reminded me that Labor Day is not the end of summer. It goes till the 20th. But in our fall presentation, we'll pick up with the after Labor Day books, or we might have been here all night. So just so you know, folks, it's not like we don't realize that there are other days in September. I don't want to get mail about that. Creation Lake is about a secret agent, a 34-year-old American woman with ruthless, ruthless tactics, bold opinions, and clean beauty, who was sent to do dirty work in France. Sadie Smith is how the narrator introduces herself to her lover, to the royal commune of, of French subversives on whom she's keeping tabs and to the reader. Sadie has met her love, Lucien, a young and well-born Parisian, by cold bump, making him believe the encounter was accidental. 
Like everyone Sadie targets, Lucienne is useful to her and is used by her. Sadie operates by strategy and dissimulation based on what her contacts, shadowy figures in business and government, instruct. In this region of centuries-old farms and ancient caves, Sadie becomes entranced by a mysterious figure named Bruno Wacombe, a mentor to the young activist who communicates only by email. Bruno believes that the path to emancipation from what ails modern life is not revolt, but a return to the ancient past. So here we've got from Rachel, who is a two-time National Book Award finalist. Next, also on September 3rd, it's The Life Impossible from Matt Haig, a guy that you might know who wrote that small book that like, you know, a few people read called The Midnight Library. Yeah, that guy. So this book is coming on uh, September 3rd from Viking. When retired math teacher Grace Winters is left a rundown house on a Mediterranean island by a long lost friend, curiosity gets the better of her. She arrives on a visa with a one-way ticket, no guidebook, and no plan. Among the rugged hills and golden beaches of the island, Grace searches for answers about her friend's life and how it ended. What she uncovers is stranger than she ever could have dreamed. But to dive into them, it's impossible truth. Grace first has to come to terms with her past. Okay, I think that's another line we're going to hear a lot, folks. Come to terms with your past. There you go. Matt Haig, coming on September 3rd. Now let's get to some historical fiction. Okay, we're going to start out with a book that is on sale now. It's Oprah's latest book club pick. It's called The Familiaris. And you're going to recognize the author's name possibly because he's the, the author of the story of Edgar Sortel. And remember how many people read that book and just enjoyed it? Well, this is the long-awaited follow-up from the 2008 book, which was another one of Oprah's picks. It's a stirge, stirring origin story of the Sawtell family and the remarkable dogs that carry the Sawtell name. It's spring in 1919 and John Sawtell's imagination has got him into trouble again. Now John and his newlywed wife, Mary, along with their two best friends and their three dogs are setting off for Wisconsin's North Woods where they hope to make a fresh start. And with a little luck, discover what it takes to live a life of meaning, purpose, and adventure. But the place they are headed is far stranger and more perilous than they realize. And it will take all their ingenuity, along with a few new friends, human, animal, and otherworldly, to realize their dreams. There you got Familiaris. Next, from Lisa Wingate, we've got a book that's, well, that's got three stickers down on the bottom. The first, it's a book reporter bets on selection. I'm going to be writing that copy tonight. I also did an interview with her that um, ran, I think we can believe it went up uh, last week. And it's one of our, it was one of our summer reading giveaway books. I love books like this that really take me into a place and a time that I really did not know that much about. Um, I knew a little bit about this because of, um, I'm going to remember the name of the book now, Tom, you're going to help me. It is, don't come to me. Okay. Um, she is the New York Times bestselling author of Before We Were Yours. So let's go with what this is about. In Oklahoma, 1909, 11-year-old Olive Augusta Radley knows that her stepfather doesn't have good intentions towards the two Choctaw girls boarded in their home as wards. When the older girl disappears, Ollie flees to the woods, taking six-year-old Nessa with her. Together, they begin a perilous journey to the remote winding stair mountains, the, a notorious territory of outlaws, treasure hunters, and desperate men. Let's flip to Oklahoma in 1990. Law enforcement ranger Valerie Boran O'Dell arrives at the newly minted Horse, Horse Thief Trail National Park, seeking a quiet place to balance a career and single parenthood. But no sooner has Valerie reported for duty than she's faced with a local controversy over the park's opening. A teenage hiker has gone missing on one of the trails, and the long hidden burial site of three children is unearthed in a cave. And what's really interesting is this what talks about. Okay, it's the Tom, it's jump on one real quick. It's something of the flower moon. I always do this one wrong. Tom, what's the words? Something of the flower moon? Summer of the. Okay, he'll come on in two seconds and tell us. Anyway, this book takes place in Oklahoma. And what happens is everyone who was Choctaw, um, man, women, and children, all were able to get uh, boy, land. And a lot of it has been um, good for its timber. It's good for its oil. And as a result, people are kidnapping these children to get rights to their land of what's going on. And it's really beautifully told because we've also got here a woman 
who is really rising to power. And she writes beautifully about this woman and what she was doing in this territory during 1909, really trying to take the cause of what was happening to these young Indian girls forward, but also trying to say to women, come forward and have a voice because she was actually somebody that was able to be elected. So beautiful, beautiful book. I really, I, I sat down and read it like a day and a half because the story was that compelling. So there you Carol, go. I'm sorry. It is Killers of the Flower Moon. And we have people in the chat who reminded us of that. So thank you. Thank you. And everybody. Thank you, everybody. And Tom knows very well that I can mix up words like super, sim um, super simply. So that is one I have never gotten straight. So there you go. Next, we've got The Ch the Glassmaker, a novel by Sh Tracy Chevalier. And I love this cover. I just love the way this looks. It's out this week. Well, it's 1486, and Ven Venice is a wealthy, opulent center for trade. Ursula Rosso is the eldest daughter in a family of glassblowers on Murano, an island revered for the craft. As a woman, she's not meant to work with glass, but she has hands for it, the heart and a vision. When her father dies, she teaches herself to make glass beads in secret, and her work supports the Rosso family fortunes. Skipping like a stone through centuries, in Venice, where time moves as slowly as molten glass, we follow Ursula and her family as they live through a creative triumph and heartbreaking loss, from a plague devastating Venice to continental soldiers stripping its palazzos bare, from the domination of Murano and its maestros to the transformation of the city of trade into a city of tourists. So there we've got the glassmaker. I like this armchair travel, I have to say. I'm travel too. Okay, I started reading this yesterday. This is Jackie by Dawn Tripp. And you might recognize Dawn's name as the uh, best-selling author of Georgia. And this was another book club selection. Jackie is the story of a woman who forged a legacy out of grief and shaped history, even as she was living it. It's the story of a love affair, a complicated marriage, and the fracturing of identity that comes in the wake of unthinkable violence. When Jackie meets charismatic Congressman Jack Kennedy in Georgetown, she's 21 and dreaming of France. She won an internship at Vogue. Kennedy, she thinks, is not her kind of adventure, that she's drawn to his mind as humor and his drive. The chemistry between them ignites, and during the White House years, the love between two independent people deepens. And then a motorcade in Dallas, three and a half seconds, that's all it was, slivered instant between the first shot, which missed the car, and the second, which did not. What's really interesting about this is Dawn saw a picture of Jackie and then she saw some others that were in a collection that were in an attic and she just looked and she did this deep dive into Jackie's life and she read everything. She read every book that she could read about Jackie, every piece, everything that she could get her hands on to try to draw a picture of who this woman really was. And the beginning of the story, I feel like she's on, I'm probably like, I'd say 50 pages in, but it's page turning just because you're seeing everything through Jackie's eyes. And she's doing just a, such a good job because you can see she did that 360 kind of view of what's going on. So looking forward to this, reading more of this one. Next, we've got Husbands and Lovers by Beatrice Williams. I have decided that June 25th should not come this soon because there are a number of books coming on June 25th that I have not finished reading. And this is not fair. I'm reading as fast as I can. So what do we have with Beatrice? Oh, she's writing in more contemporary times than usual. She's kicking it off in New England in 2022. Three years ago, a single mother, Mallory uh, Dunn's 10-year-old son, Sam, suffered acute poisoning from a toxic death camp mushroom. Now seeking for a donor kidney, um, Mallory is forced to confront two harrowing secrets from her past, her mother's adoption and her romance with her childhood best friend, Monk Adams, which was cut short by a devastating betrayal. Now let's flip to Cairo in 1951. Hungarian refugee G. Han Hannah Ainsworth has married a wealthy British diplomat with a coveting position in glamorous Cairo. But a faithful encounter with the enigmatic manager of a hotel bristling with spies leads to a passionate affair that will reawaken Hannah's longing for everything she once lost. As revolution simmers in the Egyptian streets, a pregnant Hannah finds herself snared in a game of intrigue between two men and an act of sacrifice that will echo down the generations. 
This is, um, she's with a new publisher right now. She's over at Valentine. This is one of their book group speed dating titles. You probably remember as the author of The Summer Wives. Next coming on July 2nd is another book that's got a three peep behind it or three thing behind it. It's a bets on selection. I'm going to be interviewing um, Marjan. It's a summer reading selection and stick till the end because we're going to tell you something else that's going on with this book. If you haven't seen it already on Book Reporter, it's on sale on July 2nd. I love this as much as I loved her book, The Stationery Shop. In fact, I might love this one even more. Um, Andrew, Adrian Bedore called it heartbreaking and life affirming. So it's 1950s Tehran. Seven-year-old Ellie lives in a grand comfort until the untimely death of her father, forcing Ellie and her mother to move to a tiny home downtown. And her mother definitely is not loving where they're living right now or where their state in life has gone. Luckily, on the first day of school, Ellie meets Homa, a kind, passionate girl with a brave and irrepressible spirit. Together, they play games, learn to cook in the stone kitchen of Homa's warm home, wander through the colorful stalls of the Grand Bazaar, and share their ambitions becoming lion women. But their happiness is disrupted when Ellie and her mother afforded the opportunity to return to their previous bourgeois life. Now a popular student at the best girls' school in Iran, Ellie's memories of Homa begin to fade. And years later, when her sudden reappearance in Ellie's privileged world alters the course of both of their lives. It's a story about friendship. It's a story about what happened in Iran. In, um, Iran. It's a story of what happens when two women are young and they have a dream. And then what happens? Where do their dreams go? And what happens when they're separated and they do come back together? So there you've got the Lion Women of Tehran. Next, we've got The Briar Club, which is from Kate Quinn. You know her as the best-selling author of The Rose Code. It's coming on July 9th. It's Washington, D.C. in 1950. Everyone keeps to themselves at the Briarwood House, down at the heels, all-female boarding house in the heart of the nation's capital, where secrets hide behind white picket fences. But when the love, lo lovely, mysterious widow Grace March moves into the attic room, she draw draws her odd bull collection of neighbors into unlikely friendships. Grace's weekly attic room dinner parties and window brewed sun tea become a healing bomb on all of their lives, but she hides a terrible secret of her own. When a shocking act of violence tears the house apart, the Briar Club women must decide once and for all who is the true enemy in their midst. There we've got the Briar Club. Next from Jody Pico, we've got By Any Other Name coming on August 20th. So another one that was presented during our book group speed dating event. Young playwright Melina Green has just written a new work inspired by the life of her Elizabethan ancestor, Amelia Bassano. But seeing it performed is unlikely in a theater world where the playing field isn't level for women. How many times have we heard that tonight, folks? And how true is it? As Melina wonders if she dares risk failure again, her best friend takes the decision out of her hands and submits the play to a festival under a male pseudonym. In 1581, Young Amelia Bassano is a ward of the English aristocrats. Her lessons on language, history, and writing have endowed her with a sharp wit and a gift for storytelling. But like what most women of her day, she's allowed no voice of her own. Forced to become the mistress to Lord Chamberlain, who oversees all theater productions in England, Amelia sees firsthand how the words of playwrights can move an audience. She begins to form a plan to secretly bring a play of her own to the stage, by paying an actor named William Shakespeare to front her work. Those who are familiar with Jodi and her career know that she loves the theater. She has done some adaptations of her books to the theater. So it'll be very interesting to see how this writes, this writes out again, um, look, looking at the young playwright and playwrights in two different centuries. Next, we've got Thrillers and Mysteries. First, we're starting with James Lee Burke's um, book, which is out this week or was out last week. It is already a New York Times bestseller, so it did come out last week. Cleek Purcell is Dave Robichaud's longtime friend and partner in detective work, but he has a troubled past. When, when Cleek leaves his car at the local car wash, only to return to find it ransacked by a group of, group of thugs tied to the drug trade from Mexican cartels to Louisiana, it feels personal. Just as Cleek starts to tra trail the culprits, Clara Bow hires Cleet to investigate her scheming ex-husband and a string of brutal deaths all linked back to a heavily tattooed man who seems to work around every corner. 
Cleet is experiencing shockingly lifelike hallucinations and questioning Clara's ulterior motives when he and Dave start to hear rumors of a dangerous substance with potentially catastrophic effects. The thugs who destroyed his car might have been pawns in a scream for, scream, scheme far darker than they could have imagined. So you take your car to the car wash and here comes a story. You sort of wonder if James Lee Burke went to the car wash, something happened and goes, there's the start of the story. Maybe it was the cartel. Who knows? Next from Jacqueline Winspear, we've got the final book in her Maisie Dobbs series. Hit the New York Times list last week. It's called The Comfort of Ghosts. In London, 1945, four adolescent orphans with a dark wartime history are squatting in a vacant Belgravia mansion. The owners having fled London under heavily, heavy Luftwaffe bombing. Psychologist and investigator Maisie Dobbs visits the mansion on behalf of the owners, and discovers that a demobilized soldier gravely and reeling from his experiences overseas has taken shelter with the group. Maisie's quest to bring comfort to the youngsters and an ailing soldier brings to light a decades old mystery concerning Maisie's first husband, James Compton, who was killed by piloting while piloting an experimental fighter aircraft. As Maisie unravels the threads of her dead husband's life, she is forced to examine her own painful past and question beliefs that she has always accepted as true. So this will be the wrap up of the series. Next, we've got from Frieda McFadden, The Housemaid is Watching. Oh, The Housemaid is Watching is the third installment of her Housemaid series following The Housemaid and The Housemaid's Secret. I used to claim other people's houses. Now I can't believe this home is actually mine. My husband and I saved for years to give our children the life they deserve. Even though I'm wary of our new neighbor, Mrs. Lowell, when she invites us over for dinner, it's our chance to make friends. Her maid opens the door wearing a white apron, her hair in a tight bun. I know exactly what it's like to be in her shoes, but her cold stare gives me the chills. The Lowell's maid isn't the only strange thing on our street. I'm sure I see a shadow figure watching us. My husband leaves the house late at night, and when I meet a woman who lives across the way, her words chill me to the bone. Be careful of your neighbors. Did I make a terrible mistake moving here? Not quite sure, but I will tell you that Frieda McFadden is celebrating the uh, success on the, the uh, bestseller list that we saw from Colleen Hoover last year. So if you look at the list, there's a lot of Frieda McFadden. So we want to make sure you know the latest. Next, we've got One of Our Kind by Nicola Yoon. I absolutely love the cover of this book. I just think it's, I don't know, if I was sitting reading this on the beach, I feel like I'd be a happy person looking at it. So it's out now. Jasmine and King Williams moved their family to the planned Black utopia of Liberty, California, hoping to find a community of like-minded people. King settles in at once, embracing the Liberty ethos, ethos, I'm sorry, including the Lux Wellness Center at the top of the hill. But Jasmine struggles to find her place. She expects to find liberals and social justice activists striving for racial e equality. But Liberty residents seem more focused on booking spa treatments and ignoring the world's troubles. Jasmine's only friends in the community are equally perplexed and frustrated by the resident's outlook. And then Jasmine discovers a terrible secret about Liberty and its founders. Frustration turns to dread as their loved ones start embracing the Liberty way of life. Will the truth destroy her world in ways that she never could have imagined? So there you've got one of our kind. Next, we've got The Paris Widow, which is coming from Kimberly Bell. It's out now. When Stella met Adam, she thought she had finally found a nice, normal guy. A welcome change from her present boyfriend, a precarious Jeff set her lifestyle with him. But her secure world come crashing down when Adam goes missing after an explosion in the city square. Unable to reach him, she panics. As the French police investigate, it's real that Adam was on their radar as a dealer of rare and stolen anti antiquities with a long roster of criminal clients. Reeling from the news, Stella is determined to not to leave Paris until she has the full story. Was Adam a random victim or the target of the explosion? And why is somebody following her through the streets of Paris? And I will tell you that she is part of the Killer Club. They have a Killer Club that they have a, a show on Facebook. Um, I know we've been writing about it in our newsletter. I'm not exactly sure of the time. Tom, you'll jump on in a second and tell me that. These are the um, these three women, or two of the three women, um, grabbed me at the <laughs> they're all writers conference and said, we need to shoot an Instagram live video with you. And I was like, okay. And I figured I was just going to talk about the site or what I think about books. And they go, no, 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 no. We want to know 
who you want to kill, how you're going to kill them at this conference, and when you're going to do it. I'm just there like, wow, that's a lot. So I couldn't come up with who to kill, sort of like people. So that's not my problem. And I decided that I was going to get a maid or a butler to help me or a bellman. And they're going to put a gun or knife between the mattress so that I wouldn't have my fingerprints on it at that point. And I was going to do it the Saturday night of the conference when everybody had a lot of cocktails. And they were just laughing so hard because as Tom will tell you, we were literally were walking in the door of the program and they snagged me and said, oh, can you just come over and do this like right now? So it was pretty funny. Tom, it's the Killer Club. Yeah, it's called the Killer Author Club, and they have new programs every other Tuesday. So they just did one this past Tuesday. So that's every other Tuesday. And what time do they go on on Facebook? Uh, 9 p.m. Eastern. 9 p.m. Eastern. Yes. Yeah, it's Kara Ruda, um, Heather Gudenkoff, and Kimberly Bell, and they're always inviting other people, and they'll try to get me to do something crazy, I'm sure, again. But I did it. Next, we've got A Talent for Murder from Peter Swanson, which is on sale now. Martha Ratliff conceded long ago that she'd likely spend her life alone. She was fine with it, happy with her solo existence, stimulated by her work as a librarian in Maine. But when she met Alan, a charming and sweet-natured salesman whose job took him on the road for half a year, it was really, really nice. And when he asked her to marry him, she said yes, even though he felt like a little bit like a stranger to her. A year in and the marriage was good, except for the strange blood streak on the back of one of his shirts he'd worn to a conference in Denver. As curiosity turns to sub suspicion, Martha investigates the cities Alan visited over the past year and uncovers a disturbing pattern, five unsolved cases of murdered women. She married to a serial killer, or is it merely a coincidence? You know, the blood on the shirt would be a little bit, you know, disconcerting to me, more than lipstick on the collar. I have to say. Next, we've got Middle of the Night by Riley Sager. Um, he's New York Times bestselling author of The Only One Left. And this is out this week. One July night, 10-year-old Ethan and her best friend and neighbor Billy fell asleep in a tent on a manicured lawn in a quaint New Jersey cul-de-sac. Keep in mind, Riley lives in New Jersey. In the morning, Ethan woke up alone. During the night, someone had sliced the tent open with a knife and taken Billy, and he was never seen again. This also proves to me that Ethan is a very deep sleeper if he missed that, okay? 30 years later, Ethan has reluctantly returned to his family home. Someone seems to be roaming the cul-de-sac at odd hours, and signs of Billy's presence keep appearing in Ethan's backyard. Someone praying a cruel, a cruel prank, or has Billy, long thought to be dead, somehow returned to Hemlock Circle? The closer that Ethan gets to the truth, the more he realizes that no place, be it quiet forest or suburban street, is completely safe. And the past has a way of haunting the present. So there we've got Middle of the Night by Riley Sager. And Lee Child says, full of tension, urgency, atmosphere, and feeling. This is Riley Sager at his very best. And it makes it terrifying to live in New Jersey and camp in the backyard. No children will be out there now. Next, we've got The Midnight Feats from Lucy Foley, which is also on this, out this week. It's the opening night of the manor and no expense, small or large, has been spared. The infinity pool sparkles. Crystal pouches for the guest healing have been placed in the seaside cottages and woodland hutches. The manor mule cocktail, grapefruit, ginger, vodka, and a dash of CBD oil, is being poured with a heavy hand. Everyone is wearing linen. That means they're going to be wrinkled really soon, but okay, we'll hold that thought. But under the burning midsummer sun, darkness stirs. Old friends and enemies circulate among the guests. Just outside the manor's immaculate kept grounds, an ancient forest bristles with secrets. And the Sunday morning of opening weekend, the local police are called. Something's not right with the guest. There have been a fire. A body's been discovered. Okay? This isn't the kid from the other book. This book is in this book. Keep your book straight, everybody. Keep it Keep in tune. Now we've got The Next Mrs. Parish by the best-selling author of The Lost Miss, Last Mrs. Parish, okay? And it was a Reese's Book Club pick at, at that time. So this is the sequel to the 2017 book. Hard work and immaculate planning turned Amber Patterson Parish from invisible wallflower to prominent socialite. Less than a year after her husband Jack's tax evasion scandal, Amber reigned supreme over the Bishop's Harbor community. But with Jackson being released from prison, Amber's free time and money is vanishing. Meanwhile, Daphne Parrish, Parrish left, Bush's, left Bishop's Harbor, well, that's a good one, after her divorce from Jackson, swearing she would never go back. 
But when one of her daughters runs away from home, desperate to see her father, Daphne agrees to return for the summer for their daughter's sake. When a ghost from Amber's past emerges looking for revenge, these three figures find unlikely allies in one, of, in one another. But who's playing who? There's the next Mrs. Parrish, and notice there's blood on one of those R's. Next, we've got All the Colors of the Dark by Chris Whitaker, was just announced today as a Raid with Jenna Today Show book club pick. I just finished reading this book this afternoon. It's coming out on yesterday afternoon, I'm sorry, and it comes out on Tuesday. So what have we got? We've got 1975 is a time of change in America. The Vietnam War is ending. Muhammad Ali is fighting Joe Frazier. In the small town of Monteclair, Missouri, girls are disappearing. When the daughter of a wealthy family is targeted, the most unlikely hero emerges, Patch, a local boy who saves the girl and in doing so leaves heartache in his wake. Patch and those who love him soon discover that the line between triumph and tragedy has never been finer and that their search for answers will lead them to truths that could lead to mean losing one another. This is a sprawling book. I think it's 608 pages. The chapters are each two and three pages long. So you're reading it in bits and bites. And sometimes those bits and bites go together. And with this, you're going to be traveling. You're going to want to have a map to see all the places you're going. Different things are going to happen and are going to be uncovered as the book goes on that you're going to be wondering who's good, who's bad, who's in the right place, who's in the wrong place. But I've got to tell you that when we come to the ending, there's something, there's a clue that's given, and I knew where they ended up. And it was super fun for me to see that. So it's all the colors of the dark. Kristen Hanna said it kept me frantically turning the pages and somehow made me cry at the end. And I will say that I was definitely choked up at the end as well. And then Gillian, Gillian Flynn said this book hit me like a sledgehammer and absolutely must read novel. A lot of people are talking about this one. There's a lot of pages. There's a lot of reading to be done. And some of you are going to sit there and say, why is this here? Why is it taking me there? But as you read, you'll see how it all comes together in the end. Next, we've got The God of the Woods by Liz Moore, which is the number one indie next pick. I am dying to get my hands on this book because I really enjoyed her last book, Long Bright River. It's not hard to get my hands on the book. The books are in the next room. They're all stacked up. But there's so many with the June 25th and July 2nd um, deadline um, on sale dates that remember when you were in college or in high school and you hyperventilated because the paper was due and you didn't do your homework. That's me right now. July 2nd is looming right in front of me, just like June 25th. So it's the early morning of August, 1975. A camp counselor discovers an empty bunk. Its occupant, Barbara Van Lahr has gone missing. Barbara isn't just any 13 year old. She's the daughter of the family that owns the summer camp and employs most of the region's residents. And it's not the first time a Van Lahr child has disappeared. Barbara's older brother similarly vanished 14 years ago, never to be found. As a panic search begins, a thrilling drama unfolds, chasing down the layered secrets of the Van Lahr family and the blue collar community working in its shadow. Liz Moore's multi-threaded story invites readers into a rich and gripping dynasty of secrets and second chances. The pub date for this book was moved up to July 2nd. Sometimes means something's become a pick. Just tossing that out there. I really don't know. Just tossing out a clue. Next, we've got Bad Taurus by Cara Carvo, Carver, which is coming um, on July 9th. It is a, just added as a summer reading selection. So when you look at that page and you say, oh, that book's there now. Yes, we keep adding to this as we go on. I actually had the pleasure of meeting Caro at um, a pre- a, a pre-pub event, and we had just such a good time talking. So when best friends Darcy, Kamala, and Kate escape for a post-force retreat to the Maldives, I mean, like, let's not go like, you know, shabby folks, the place to relax, reset, and embrace a fresh start in life, Darcy is learning to be a free woman at 42. Kamala has found the perfect calling as a fitness and wellness influencer with a devoted following. Kate is finally working on the book she meant to write after years of telling other people's stories. Their dream getaway, the exclusive and isolated Sapphire Island Resort with luxurious private villas, crystal clear waters, and sun-dressed wide be white sand beaches. Relaxation is guaranteed. But this is no ordinary friendship, and they're not only the only guests on the island with secrets. Who left the body on the beach? And who's next? So there you've got bad tourists. But I am so looking forward to taking a trip to the Maldives. 
Next from Daniel Silva, we've got his latest book also coming on July 9th called A Death in Cornwall. Art, art, art restorer and legendary spy Gabriel Alone has slipped quietly into London to attend a reception at the old at the Court Alt Gallery, celebrating the return of a stolen self-portrait by Vincent van Gogh. But when an old friend from the Devon and Cornwall police seeks his help with a baffling murder investigation, he finds himself pursuing a powerful and dangerous new adversary. The victim is Charlotte Blake, a celebrated professor of art history from Oxford, who's spending weekends in the same seaside village where Gabriel once lived under an assumed identity. Her murder appears to be the work of a diabolical serial killer who's been terrorizing the Cornish countryside. But there are a number of telltale inconsistencies, including a miss missing mobile phone. And then there's the mysterious three-letter cipher she left behind on a notepad in her study. So we've got a death in Cornwall. From Jamie Day, we've got one big happy family. This is the author of The Block Party, Remember, it's one big fa happy family, except they're not. The Precipice is a legendary family-owned hotel on the rocky coast of Maine. Ah, oh, we're in Maine again, folks. With recent passing of their father, the Bishop sisters, Iris, Vicky, and Faith, have come for the weekend to claim it. But with a hurricane looming and each of the Bishop sisters harboring dangerous secrets, there's murder in the air, and not everyone who checks into the Precipice will be checking out. Each sister um, wants what's rightly hers. And in the mix is Precipice's 19-year-old chambermaid, Charlie Kelly, who is smart, resilient, older than her years, and in desperate straits. The arrival of the Bishop sisters could spell disaster for Charlie. Will they close the hotel, fire her, discover her habit of pilfering from the guests, or even worse, warn that she's using a guest room to hide a woman on the run? So there you've got one big happy family, except they're not, you know? Not sure about going to Maine. I'm not sure. I just remember everybody gets together and they're harboring secrets. So when the family gets together just time, you should just go, what's your secret? Because everyone's harboring them according to these books. Next, we've got Like Mother, Like Daughter from Kimberly McCrae coming on July 30th. When Cleo, a student at NYU, arrives late for dinner at her child at home in Brooklyn, she finds food burning in the oven and no sign of her mother, Cat. Then Cleo discovers her mother's bloody shoe under the sofa. Something terrible has happened, but what? Turns out the cat has been lying. She's not just a lawyer, she's her firm's fixer. And in the days leading up to her disappearance, Cat has become aware of multiple threats, demands for money from her unfaithful, soon-to-be ex-husband, evidence that Cleo has slipped back into a relationship that's far riskier than she understands, and menacing anonymous messages from her past, all of which she keeps hidden from Cleo. This is one of our Mother's Day giveaway books. I absolutely love that we gave it away for Mother's Day, like mother, like daughter. This is from the author of Reconstructing Amelia. Next, we've got Sherry LaPena's book, What Have You Done? And she's the author of The Couple Next Door. And she is what I call my one sit read. When I start reading one of Sherry's books, I basically don't get up until I'm finished. So where are we going to have in this one? Nothing happens in the sleepy little Vare Hill. Let's see. Blech. Nothing, try that again. Nothing happens in sleepy little Fair Hill, Vermont. But this morning that will change. And one in innocent question could be deadly. What have you done? Teenagers get their kicks telling ghost stories in the old graveyard. Parents trust that the kids will arrive home safe from school. But Diana Brewer isn't lying safely in the bed where she belongs. Instead, she lies in a hayfield, circled by vultures, discovered by a local farmer. How quickly a girl becomes a ghost. How quickly a town of friendly, familiar places becomes a town of suspects, a place of fear and paranoia. Someone in Fairhill did this, and everyone wants answers. So there you go with What Have You Done? Next, we've got House of Glass by Sarah Peckin, and it's coming out August 6th. And yes, this will be a summer reading um, title. I believe this is our last one of the summer, but I might be wrong because books keep being added. Rose Barclay is a nine-year-old girl who witnessed the possible murder of her nanny in the midst of her parents' bitter divorce and immediately stopped speaking. Stella Hudson is, the, is a best interest attorney appointed to serve as counsel for children in custody cases. From the moment Stella passes through the iron security gate and steps into the gilded historic DC home of the Barclays, she realizes the case is even more twisted and the Barclay family far more trouble than she feared. And there's something else eerie about the house itself. It's a plastic house. 
there's not a single piece of glass to be found. As Stella comes closer to uncovering the secrets the Barclays are des desperate to hide, danger wraps around her like a shroud, and her past and present are set on a collision course in ways she never expected. So there we've got House of Glass, which has a really cool cover on the front of it. Next, we've got Worst Case Scenario by T.J. Newman. She's the author of Drowning and Falling. Okay, so uh, she was a, a, she worked in the airline industry for another number of years, and she writes of the books that you don't want to be reading on an airplane. Is as with this one, when a pilot suffers a heart attack at thirty five thousand feet, a commercial airliner filled with passengers crashes into a nuclear power plant in a small town of Wakita, Minnesota, which becomes a ground zero for a catastrophic national crisis with global implications. That's a lot. The International Nuclear Event Scale tracks nuclear disasters. It has seven levels. Level seven is major accident with only two on record, Fukushima and Chernobyl. There's never been a level eight until now. In worst case scenario, ordinary people, PowerPoint employees, firefighters, teachers, families, neighbors, and friends are thrust into an, an extraordinary situation as they face the ultimate test of their lives. What I love about the books that TJ writes is that you have ordinary people coming together and trying to come up with solutions. And what are they going to do when they are in these impossible situations of what is going on? They're on the plane. What is going to happen to this? And where? what are the implications going to be for everyone? And how can we make it better? Really interesting how she pulls her characters together in those situations. Next from William Ken Kruger, which I know is a huge Huge favorite of our readers. We've got Spirit Crossing. Absolutely love this cover. It is coming on August 20th. So what do we have in this one? The disappearance of a local politician's teenage daughter is major news in Minnesota. It's a huge manhunt is launched to find her. Cork O'Connor's grandson stumbles across the shallow grave of a young Ojibwe woman, but nobody seems that interested. Nobody that is except Cork and the newly formed Iron Lake Ojibwe uh, Tribal Police. As Cork and the tribal officers dig into the circumstances of this mysterious and grim discovery, they uncover a connection to a missing teenager. And soon it's clear that Cork's grandson is in danger of being the killer's next victim. We had one of our readers read an advanced copy of this. And she said she cried when she got to the end of it. So just know tissues should be nearby if you're a crier. Next one we've got is This Is Why I Lied. It's a Will Trent um, novel. Uh, Will Trent series runs on ABC. It's by Karen Slaughter coming also on August 20th. For GBI investigator Will Trent and medical examiner Sarah Linton, the Calpine Lodge seems like the ideal getaway to celebrate their honeymoon. Set on a gorgeous off-the-grid mountaintop property, it's a perfect place to unplug and reconnect. Till a bone-chilling scream cuts through the night, Mercy McAlpine, the manager of the lodge, is dead. With a vicious storm raging and the one access road to the property washed out, the murderer must be someone on the mountain. But as Will and Sarah investigate the McAlpine family and the other guests, they realize that everyone here is lying. Lying about their pests, lying to their family, lying to themselves. Trapped in the resort, Will and Sarah must untangle a dec decades-old web of secrets to discover what happened to Mercy. And with the killer strike to price strike again, trip of a lifetime becomes a race against the clock. Yeah, don't go to those gorgeous places. You just never know what's going to happen. Next from Kate Atkinson, we've got Death at the Sign of the Rook, which is coming on September 3rd. It's highly, highly anticipated sixth installment in Kate Atkinson's Jackson Brody series pays homage to the masters of the mystery genre, from Agatha Christie and Dorothy Sayers to the modern era of Knives Out and only mur murders in the building. In a sleepy Yorkshire town, ex-detective Jackson Brody starving off boredom and malaise. His only case is the seeming tedious matter of a stolen painting. But Jackson soon uncovers a string of unsolved art thefts that leave him down a dizzying spiral of disguise and deceit. De Burton make peace, a formerly magnificent estate now partially converted into a hotel, hosting Murder Mystery Weekends. So that's what they should do with a lot of these hotels. They should just be called Murder Mystery Weekend because it seems like it happens there. Next, we've got The Haunting of Moscow House, which is coming from Elisa Olesia, Olisa Sal Salkanova Gilmore on September 3rd. 
actually love this cover. Um, Chanel Cleeton said that this is both atmospheric and, and gripping, and I feel like they really conveyed that with the cover. It's the summer of 1921, and a group of Bolsheviks have taken over Irena and Lily Golotiva's ancestral home in Moscow. The remaining members of their family are ordered to move into the cramped attic, while officials take over the entire wing of grand rooms downstairs. Sisters know what they must forget their noble upbringing to make their way in this new Soviet Russia. The house begins to whisper of a traumatic past, not as dead as they thought. Eager to escape it and their unwelcome new landlords, Irena and Lily find jobs with the recently arrived American Relief Administration. But at home, the spirits of their deceased family awaken, desperate in part what really happened to them during the revolution. Soon, one of the officials living in the house is found dead. Was his death caused by something supernatural or was it by someone all too human? And our arena, Lily and their family next. So there's the haunting of Moscow house. Then from Lee Child, we have um, a collection of short stories coming on September 3rd. It's Safe Enough and Other Stories. For the past 20 years, he's been one of the best-selling novels and uh, authors in the world, thanks to popularity to his iconic and instantly recognizable hero, Jack Reacher. But even at the height of Reacher's fame, Child's short story writing was not confined to the series. Throughout the course of his career, he published tales about a range of characters on both sides of the law, including assassins, a bodyguard, CIA, and FBI agents, gangsters, and more. Meticulously plotted and packed in with Child's trademark action and suspense, the short stories are going to show his mastery of the short form, and they've never been collected before now. So there you've got some like shovel, body, going in the trunk. Hmm, sure, it's a thriller. And we've got some memoirs, biographies, and other nonfiction. We're going to start with Ben and Me. I still can't wink with my right eye. Um, it's on sale now. Ben Franklin lingers in our lives and our imaginations. He's only one of two non-presidents to appear on U.S. currency. That's a trivia fact to try out in the family. He's a founder, a statesman, a scientist, an inventor, a diplomat, a publisher, a humorist, and a philosopher. He believed in the American experiment. But Ben Franklin's greatest experiment was Ben Franklin. In the spirit of that betterment, Eric Weiner embarks on an ambitious quest to live the way Ben did. Not a conventional biography. It's a guide to living and thinking well, as Ben Franklin did. And so it's always also about curiosity, diligence, and most of all, the elusive goal of self-improvement. So Weiner follows Franklin from Philadelphia to Paris, from Boston to London. He uncovers Ben's life lessons, large and small. And I still can only wink with one eye. Next, we've got the Friday Afternoon Club by Griffin Dunn. It's a family memoir. I just finished listening to this today because I love to listen to memoirs and Griffin narrates it himself. It's a memorial of growing up in larger than life characters in Hollywood and Manhattan. He finds wicked humor and glimmers of light in even the most painful of circumstances. In the midst of it all, Griffin's 22 year old sister, Dominique was beautiful, brut brutally strangled to death by her ex-boyfriend leading to one of the most infamous public trials of the 1980s. The outcome was a travesty of justice that marked the beginning of their father, Dominic Dunn's career as a crime reporter, the Vanity Fair, and a victim's right advocate. Ad, 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 ad. Um, the Friday Afternoon Club is no mere celebrity memoir. It is down to the bones of family and story that embraces the poignant absurdities and the best and worst of its lovable, infuriating, funny, and moving characters, its author most of all. And Griffin tells a lot of very, very funny stories besides the very sad one of what happened with the sister. Next, we've got Traveling on the Path of Joni Mitchell by Ann Powers, which is out now. For decades, Joni Mitchell's life and music have enraptured listeners. One of the most celebrated artists of generation, she's inspired countless musicians from peers like James Taylor to inheritors like Prince and Brandy Carlisle and authors who've been dissecting her music and her life in their writing. At the same time, she's always been a force, beckoning us still closer with the other arm. She pushes us away. Given this, music critic Ann Powers wondered if there's another way to draw insights from the life of the singular musician who never stops moving, never stops experimenting. and traveling, Powers seeks to understand Mitchell through her myriad journeys. Next, we've got up to, up to the Uptown Local, Joy, Jeff, and Joan Didion, a memoir by Corey Ledbeater. 
Aspiring novelist in his early 20s, Corey Wedbeater was presented with an opportunity to work with for a well-known writer whose identity, identity was kept confidential. Since the tumultuous days of childhood, Corey had sought refuge from the rougher parts of life in the pages of books. And suddenly he found himself the personal assistant to a titan of literature, Joan Didion. In the year, nine years that follow, Corey shared Joan's rarefied world, transformed not only by her blazing intellect, but also by her generous friendship and mentorship. But secretly, Corey was spiraling. He reeled from the death of a close friend. He spent his weekends at a federal prison visiting his father, who was serving time for fraud. He struggled day after day to write the novel that would validate him as a real writer. And meanwhile, the forces of addiction and depression loomed large. I'll share something about Joan Didion that was um, interesting. It was at the National Book Awards years ago when she was um, when she was honored. And the next day, I was at the Miami Book Fair and I heard her speak. And I had my her book with me. I was like, oh, should I go get it signed? Should I not go get it signed? And I decided no, because I usually don't do that. I was out, got all the way out to my car and I turned around and I came back. I said, this might be the only opportunity you ever have to talk to Joan Didion, tell her how much you enjoyed her work and congratulate her on last night. And so I waited on a long line and I went and I had to talk to her and I never forgot that moment and that very, very brief conversation. So there's my Joan Didion story, but he's got a whole memoir. Okay, this book is really fun. It's JFK Jr. An Intimate Oral Biography. It is by Rosemary Terenzio and Liz McNeil. Um, Rosemary was his personal assistant for years. And this is the first oral biography of him, an extraordinary, intimate, comprehensive look at the real man behind the myth, sharing never be told stories and insights. His closest friends, confidants, lovers, classmates, teachers, and colleagues paint a vivid portrait of one of the most beloved pictures of the figures of the 20th century, revealing how the boy who saluted became the man who came to know and love and who still captures the public imagination 25 years after his tragic death. JFK Jr. dives deep into his complicated psyche and explores the what-ifs, illuminating both the cultural and political moment he inhabited and the way this son of a president so full of promise and possibility embodied America's most cherished hopes. I remember seeing him on the street in New York one time and it was like, hi, John. And he was like, hi back. And it, like he was greeting me like we were old friends because that's, I think, the way he kind of lived his life was to do that. There's also a funny story. I don't know if he'll make it in the book that um, when he was up at school, their apartment was a complete mess. He was going to Brown and his mother was coming up to meet him. And his friends said, um, he turns to his friends, he goes, well, let me describe my mother. She's got brown hair. And he is literally describing Jackie Kennedy to his friends. And they're going, we know who your mother is. And she comes in, the apartment is a complete mess. I mean, you can't find anything. And she needs to use the telephone. And they go, um, and she's on her hands and knees, finding a cord and pulling the cord to try to figure out where the phone is. So he's got, I'm sure there are lots of funny stories about you know what he was like through the years. This is Wanted, Toddler's Personal Assistant. How nannying for the 1% taught me about the myths of equality, motherhood, and upward mobility in America by Stephanie Kaiser. She moved to New York after college to pursue, pursue a career in writing. She quickly learns that her entry-level salary won't cover the high cost of living, never mind her crushing student loan debt. But there's one in-demand job that pays more than enough to allow Stephanie to stay in the city, nannying for the 1%. Desperate to escape the poverty of her own childhood and jump social classes, she falls into a job that hijacks her life for the next seven years, a personal assistant to toddlers on Manhattan's Upper East Side. And some of the stories include being in the same room with the parents while the toddlers were there, that you were watching the toddlers while the parents were just in the room. It sounds like it's we have really funny moments and very serious moments as well. Um, next, we've got Drawn Testimony by My Four Decades as a Courtroom Sketch Artist by Jane Rosenberg. It's on sale on August 13th. And we're including this. It's really interesting. For over 40 years, she's been at the heart of the news cycle, covering almost every major trial that's passed through New York justice system as a courtroom sketch artist, including the most recent Donald Trump hush money trial. In Drawn Testimony, Rosenberg brings us into the high dramatic stakes world of her craft, where art, psychology, and courtroom drama collide. Over the course of her legendary career, Jane has had a front row seat to some of the most iconic and notorious moments in our nation's recent history. And readers are going to learn how she honed her unique powers of perception and what her portraits reveal not only about her subjects, 
but about the human condition in general. So just think about how quickly she is drawing. And so you can understand who the people are that are in the courtroom. <clears throat> so far, I've named 16 bestseller uh, bets on books this year. There's 16 of them. Um, there'll be more to come, I'm sure. But this is where we are at this point. And I don't have a set number at the beginning and the end of the year. Sometimes I read more in the second half. Sometimes they're more in the front. Remember, I do, do a year-end contest where somebody wins all of them and others win part of them. These are our recent book reporter talks to interviews with Lisa Wingate, Ruth Reichel. Um, this fabulous book, Did I Ever Tell You? I talked to Genevieve Kingston, um, we call her Gwen, um, long after we're gone with Tara uh, Shelton Harris, Anne Hood talking about The Stolen Child, and Mary Kay Andrews talking about Summers at the Saint. Really super fun interviews. I enjoyed every single one of them. The best thing is usually when I finish with the authors, they go, that wasn't like an interview. That was like a conversation. I love that. So I guess we should call it conversations. Next, we've got a special contest. This is running right now. I don't know if my board is over this to win copies of the Lion Women of Tehran. Um, the contest is going till Friday at noon. That's when it ends. And you can enter to win a copy of this book. We're giving away 25. We want you to read it. We want you to be talking about it. It's a book that I absolutely love. Yes, it's going to be a bets on for sure. These are the summer reading giveaways that we're doing on selected days. And Tom is like completely amazing that he has actually rejiggered this and added Bad Taurus, which we just added to the uh, to the group. So it's a, a wonderful selection. If you're looking for ideals, ideas for books to read this summer, you don't want to not miss these. And our next Book of Chino Live event is going to be next Tuesday, the 25th at 8 o'clock. Yes, an event on a Tuesday where William Ken Kruger is going to discuss the river we remember with us. New York Times bestseller, a book reporter, bets on pick. Did a very early interview with him when this book first came out with some early readers of the book. And this time we're going to do something different. We're looking for questions from anybody in the audience, whether you want to be on camera or not. Go sign up to do this and uh, shoot me an email with, you know, Kent in the subject line and tell me what your question is and we'll get it into the discussion. Or we could just do it during the Q&A, whichever you prefer. And now let's see. Our next Book of Chino Live afternoon event is going to be on July 9th and it's going to be, uh, I'm sorry, July 10th. And we're going to be talking about books from July 9th to August 16th and do a peek ahead at September. So we hope that you join us for that. Thank you.